Dear Professor Bakshi, uh, let me thank you first to take once more the time uh, to spend with us in order to give a better understanding of, of what the subject of this center is, to understand law as culture. Uh, Upendra, uh, you have become a friend during the time that you spent at this um, institute since October 21. In 2010, oh, yeah. it was the first time that you made a talk in this institute. Yes, yeah, I'm very And then job. I yeah. counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight important interventions Goodness that me. you did wow. at the center. Right, right. And um, you might understand that we are interested and in all the people that will listen to us um, to have a better understanding of where this incredible um, innovativeness, uh, this force to think things in a new way comes from. Um, I'm not here in the role of a psychoanalyst, but I think I would be the wrong person for that. <laughs> but is there not always something in the child that brings us uh, to making efforts to do more than the boys uh, from the right and the left have uh, mm. done? Uh, where comes the power from that you have in your mind? Well, thank you, Werner. First of all, it's been a wonderful uh, time for me to have been born for so long on two visits. And um, uh, I have learned in a great deal and unlearned a great deal. And I think unlearning is also important in one's life. Um, so that it has been a wonderful experience, a highly collegiate experience and uh, with the ecology of the Great River Rhine. Mm -hmm and uh, all the events up in the Max Weber Auditoria that you mentioned. Um, it's a wonderful beginning and I must congratulate you for taking the leadership of this institute. Um, and I'm sure that over the years it will grow um, in leaps and bounds. There's no question about it. So thank you again for having me and uh, thank you for finding time. I know you're uh, going to do wonders in Naples with your artwork and display and so on. And this was, it was good of you to take this time. Now coming to your question, well it's, it's a way, I wish you were a psychoanalyst indeed. <laughs> so I what would like well, to grab uh, apart Freud. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting question, the sources yes. of creativity yeah. in any person's life are sort of uh, uh, due to several stimuli, several uh, situations. Uh, biographical incidents, uh, openness to the uh, understanding of other people's suffering, sensitivity to others, openness. In my case, I, I uh, was, uh, I started my, my habits of reading, started very early when I was five or six. Oh yes, I see. And like uh, John Stuart Mill, a little I, bit like him. Uh, yes. I will not produce anything like he has produced, but nevertheless, we started very early, um, I see. and uh, we didn't know very much e English. Mm -hmm. Mother tongue was Gujarati, Gujarati language of Mohandas Gandhi, mm -hmm. um, and a place called Rajkot, where I went uh, to school. The same school he went uh, yes. several uh, decades ago, and so on. Yeah. So we had a, a British library called Lang Library. We used to go uh, six or seven years of age. We used to get all kinds of books which we did not understand, but we still learned to read. And I think one of the sources of creativity lies in this tension between having a text and reading it on the one hand and really understanding it. So that is a dislocation that takes place between the text and interpretation. But eventually I got, I got, uh, I, I, I read some very marvelous novels by the time I was 14 or 15, particularly of a man called Thomas Hardy. Okay. Was a very uh, writer of great tragic prose. Um. And he conditioned uh, my mind, there was inclination at least 
that was a tragic sense of life, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, to use a phrase of Pandamono. So it was the, one of the things what that made me uh, uh, what I may be today is this habit of reading. Upendra, and uh, this might also be interesting for others, uh, really, to know that you share your reading. I never met somebody who shares so much intellectually. Um, it is a gesture of giving to others. When you found a text that is interesting in your mind, yeah. Yeah. you give it to others. You want to share and not to keep. I know a lot of intellectuals who just want to keep their truth for them because in a narcissistic way. But you are sharing and this sharing of knowledge uh, is something that impressed me a lot during the time you were a fellow at uh, our center. Let me come back uh, to the questions and the memories of the youth. Uh, if you were so much impressed by poetry, I could imagine to be seduced mm -hmm. to become a poet. But uh, you preferred to be engaged in poetics of the law in a certain way uh, yeah. and not to be a poet. Was it a difficult decision or was it just a contingent one? I could imagine that you have this no, power also. I was student of literature all along and uh, did my master, bachelor's in literature. I student particularly of Milton and uh, of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And uh, Therefore, once one reads, and I, of course, was studied the great classics of Sanskrit literature, but the romantic work. So, if you read very inspirational kind of poetry, powerful poetry, yeah, it begins to unleash mm -hmm. poetic energies within your own yes, self, it whether, is. Whatever, whatever quality it is. Yeah. And we had a wonderful, um, uh, what we call Mushaira in Urdu, but a gathering of poets in, mm -hmm. in the city where I grew up. And, the, and they encouraged us young people mm. to compose and recite their poems and helped yeah. us to correct our oddities and language and so on. So it's one, one is, the, is the, the sense of the tragic, the enchantment with the, with the imagination and the actual articulation of one's uh, basic sentiments. So it was, it was, I was, a, I, I can't say I was, I mean, I started as, not as a professional person of literature, but student of literature and a budding poet. And I've been budding ever since then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, Upendra, if you talk about enchantment, and I have a look at your further career, your later career, there is a period of pure disenchantment. First disenchantment, I would say, to study with Hans Kelsen. Hans Kelsen, who is represented in this Durkheim Salon uh, at the other side of the yes, wall. Yes, and yeah. he, with his theory, pure theory of law, emptied of any kind of content, at least in his imagination, what is not true in the end, in, in the analysis, of course, mm -hmm. because the fundamental norm is something also uh, substantive, if one looks more closely, at least to my understanding. But this is something very formalized, very logical, and so forth. How was it possible that during the time you were uh, a student at Berkeley, uh, visibly, Hans Kelsen was interested in this guy, to talk with this guy from India, from a foreign, very foreign country, <laughs> uh, for an Austrian-born uh, 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 guy. And um, uh, on the other side, you were interested uh, in his kind of theorizing and uh, are there any traces uh, uh, you would say this experience left for your further writing and way of thought? Yeah, well, that's an interesting <coughs> reminiscence. I, um, in between, after I did my lit literature, uh, be a bachelor's in literature, I wanted to do a master's. I moved to Bombay. Mm. Yeah, and I couldn't do masters because uh, somebody, a great woman, 
only woman in the shipping industry at that time took mm -hmm. fancy to me and asked me to be to help her okay so i became a, i went and joined this sindhya steam navigation company Aha, uh -huh. interesting. And I couldn't study read literature part-time. Okay. And she commissioned me to write the history of the shipping company, which was involved with um, Gandhi's nationalist struggle. Ah, yes. And freedom of coastal shipping and so on. I'm yeah. coming to Kelsen in a minute. Yeah. And then I wrote a history called the Saga of Sindhya. That was my first historical writing. Yeah. For her. And then she wanted me to be a, a shipping man. Mm-hmm and made me an officer and asked me to go to Hamburg and then to London. Mm -hmm. And then she said, you'll manage her someday. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I started studying law, which was at that time available part-time as well. I did one semester of law and I uh, was disenchanted with the subject so much that I gave it up. Okay. Okay, very interesting also. I to couldn't that. stand this dryness of uh, technicalities of law. Mm -hmm. Then the next year, I again, my friends persuaded me. And I went to the government law college where uh, Dr. Ambedkar was once upon a time a principal. Mm -hmm. And then I started uh, reading uh, jurisprudence and uh, mm. legal philosophy. Yeah. And then I never looked back. I got engaged with the, and that's partly my relation to Kelsen. So when I did my uh, master's in India, in Bombay, um, I had three places, in, two places in mind to go in the United States. One was uh, Harvard University, because mm -hmm. not because Harvard University, but because a man called Roscoe Pound. Yes, he was there at the was time. There. Yeah. Another was California, because a man called Hans Kelsen was there. Okay. There was no other choice in okay. my mind. Okay. <laughs> as happened, Professor Pound uh, died before I could. Uh, yeah. But we were in correspondence, a very generous and a kind man. I had oh, several yeah. issues mm. about mm. Uh, understanding of the theory of legal demand and adjustment of interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did not know typing or anything. I used to write in long hand yes, and used to reply to him. At that time? <laughs> but he couldn't, he couldn't, yeah. he could, I couldn't be with him. And then I went to California and I found that Professor Kelson uh, did not teach in the law school, had never taught in the law school. He, in fact, was a political science department named as Hans Kelson Hall. Yes. And he had vanished for about 10, 15 years. He was mm -hmm. not actively teaching. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very distraught. You know, we have I this tradition imagine. of yeah. uh, finding a guru. And then yes, so and we know. Very, <laughs> very unusual one, but that's, that's a strong tradition. Yeah. So I um, then met him. Mm -hmm. uh, cut a long story short, he was reluctant to see this student. You're not seeing students. Mm -hmm. But Mrs. Kelson was very kind and she mm -hmm. organized a meeting and then said, if my husband agrees to see you again, that's fine. But this first time I can do it, not mm -hmm. structurally. And I must have given a good impression. So mm -hmm. Professor Kelson and I used to meet every fortnight. Mm -hmm. For three years I was in Berkeley. Oh, that's incredible. And um, his impact on me has been not so much as the author of the pure theory law of law, general theory of law mm -hmm. and state, his impact on me has been uh, twofold. Uh, one, uh, his uh, work on justice. Mm -hmm. He published a book before his death mm -hmm. on the idea of justice, mm -hmm. a collection. Mm -hmm. But the first yeah. is on yeah. the divine yeah. justice, yeah. first article. Yeah. And the second uh, aspect that impressed me and I carried forward was his work on inter international law. Yeah. Mm. And extension of a legal theory to public mm. international law, which mm. was not usual to, to be done. Mm. And we had a number of discussions, and um, I remember once uh, we got into a problem of communication, and I said, uh, distinction between validity and efficacy in his work yeah. is a distinction without difference. Yes. Now, I Professor see. Kelsen for the first time in our three years experience, got a little upset. Okay. Now, distinction without difference was, he felt it was an offense for me to say that because mm. he, he, he cannot possibly make a distinction without difference. He was a logical mind. 
Yeah. And this is not what I meant to say, but it, it, that's of, how of it came it out. Took it yeah. And then he said, uh, in which language do you read me? And I said, English. Say, if you don't read German, how can you ever expect me to understand? <laughs> And that also uh, left a mark on him, but unfortunately I never learned the language. I should, as a mark of my respect for him, and I will. But um, he was an extremely kind man. He was always very, and there's a, a very charming side to him as a person, mm. a very civilized, and very uh, almost uh, childlike quality about him. He used to ask me, what do I think, when will the Third World War happen? Mm -hmm. And I used to say, Professor Carson, I'm I a war know. baby, but I don't think there's going to be a third war. And he never visited Europe. Mm -hmm. And he was always apprehensive of a violent war breaking out. Yeah. And that I found a most uh, uh, puzzling aspect of him. But, you know, a, a man who has to cause to migrate in the most difficult yeah. situations, yeah. leaving whole tradition of learning yeah. and yeah. Uh, scholarship there behind and adjust in a country like United States. At that time, there was not too much understanding of European uh, legal thought and theory. Yeah. Professor Pound was, of course, a, a okay. polymath, and yeah. he wrote it. But generally, uh, so it was a big, big, a big moment in his life, and a painful one. We never, ever forgot the memories of the war, yeah. and remained apprehensive. So, could you imagine that your interest in violence and violence against women, violence against the poor, against the vulnerable people, that's in a way the main topic and the main focus of your legal and political interest, if you're allowed to say that. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that there is a link even from somebody as Kelsen, known as the pure th purest theorists of all pure uh, uh, theorists, um, that this violence question uh, came also from him, but there will be certainly also other sources, experiences uh, from the Indian context that brought you to this topic that became the central one in your uh, academic life, if I see right. Yes, I, I think it became, uh, it's, um, it had a very strong uh, impression on me in, in terms of my discussion with Professor Kelsen. Um, once I used the term epistemic violence, yeah. and he was yeah. very violent yeah. indeed in his response. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, certainly, you, you know, can imagine. He, what did he, he, say? He, had he, he said, how can knowledge be violent? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't recall yeah, his exact yeah. words, yeah. because the practice of knowledge, of thought, is to is in, in a sense an ethical practice. Mm. But it is an, first of all analytical practice where you use your words, you cleanse, it, cleanse them of ambiguities, mm. refine and purify the meanings. And once you do so, then there cannot be a question of violence of the word, according to my memory of what he yeah, said. Yeah. But I was interested, I was interested in the, I grew up in Berkeley, I really grew up, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of participation in the anti-Vietnam war protests, yeah, yeah. the free speech movement days, and, um, and the coverage of the Vietnam war, yeah. that began from the beginning that we were exposed to. Uh, uh, and I did say to Professor Carlson that, you know, uh, if there is no world war, there are a series of wars that are going on mm -hmm. after the Charter, his great book on Charter he had written. So that the uh, violence of the state is something that no law can ever fully restrain. Mm. In fact, the law can often justify it in terms of uh, ambiguity of standards, uh, international humanitarian law, uh, treatment of uh, uh, civilians versus combatants, who is a civilian, who is a non-combatant, who is a combatant. Um, he listened to me, but I, I didn't think he was very really excited by all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But my real, uh, after Berkeley, my real uh, engagement began with the Australian Aborigines when I started teaching in Sydney Law School. From mm -hmm. uh, Berkeley, I went to Sydney mm -hmm. to work with Professor Julia Stone. Mm -hmm. And um, and he was a great, a great jurist and a great international lawyer. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, it's that time that we found, I found that there was a complete conspiracy of silence about the plight of Australian Aborigines, one mm. of the Earth's mm. most ancient peoples. Yeah. And um, uh, they were being discriminated, uh, they were poor, and they were exploited yeah. in every way. And this was their land, Werner. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, if you want to understand colonization or the yeah. other side of Europe, yeah. one has mm -hmm. to go and meet these people and, yeah. uh, to, and, and see what, what had been done to them. But I took uh, interest in their... In their uh, at that time, we had no Aboriginal student. I got one only even on my visit in 1976. Really? Very mm -hmm. few Aboriginal mm -hmm. law students, mm -hmm. at any rate. So the, a real apartheid, mm -hmm. in a real yeah. sense, a civilizational apartheid, not a policy one. Yeah. Um, and we found that uh, a, multi, a giant multinational corporation called Nabalco was acquiring the land. And uh, my students and I prepared a brief yeah. on, on that. And, 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 and we won partly that case over the land rights, not fully. But it broke uh, the conspiracy of silence. Mm -hmm. And with a, for the first time in Australian legal education, there were a number of courses on law and the Aborigines, which started as a result of this. Oh, oh this is very so interesting. So it is the engagement with um, uh, the other, as Levinas calls the yeah. face of the yeah. other. Yeah. At that time, I had not read Levinas. Okay. Was, but something was preparing me to read him, receive him. That's what I believe. That's great. Uh, uh, however, I would say so. I can understand uh, this um, um, this feeling and uh, uh, those emotions to be with the other and to participate and uh, and to share. Also, that's a sharing uh, of a specific kind of knowledge, a judicial knowledge, and yeah. uh, this kind of knowledge means also and has also technical aspects. It has to do with understanding procedures. If yeah. you are an activist and you're just shouting at the world without having any legal result, uh, your weapons are empty and your weapons Absolutely. won't yeah. work. So uh, in your lifetime you became also a, a lawyer and a technically uh, very well educated uh, 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 legal theorist who, who was able to um, to realize uh, rights and uh, so um, did it change a little bit uh, this um, um, sometimes negative look one has towards those technical aspects the formal side of law what do you say, think about this relationship of formal and substantive, as Weber calls it, mm, never, yeah. we, we can leave it aside, but yeah. whether rationality or uh, elements of justice and uh, of legality, uh, is it not important to bring both of them together? Oh, it's terribly important, but it's never easy. Never easy. It's never yeah. easy. It's as important as it is difficult. Um, I'll give a couple of examples. I, I've learned the importance of uh, uh, bringing law into action from uh, people who had never studied law or never yeah, got yeah. a university degree. I'll give you two examples. Um, one was a sex workers union in Rajasthan mm -hmm. uh, who were, uh, were protesting as harassment and mm -hmm. plight of the children mm -hmm. out of those relationships. And some of them came to me and said, we want to organize ourselves. Under what law can we organize our activities for welfare? Yeah. And I said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And they said, we are a professor of law. And I was by that time known as a little bit of an activist. Okay. 
And then I, I said, I'll come back to it in a couple of months' time. I read every little legislation on uh, associations, company, trust, uh, trade unions, uh, everything. I, I read a lot of judgments. I studied very hard because mm. they had a problem. And they'd come to me with an expectation mm. that I would want to help them. Mm. Yes. But in order that I could help them, I had to learn the law myself. Yeah. When I learned it, I said, you go and register yourself a trade union. Mm -hmm. And I knew what the registrar of trade union would say. There has to be an employer-employee relationship yeah, clear. between clear. a sex worker clear. and a client. There is no such That's relationship. Different. Yeah. So we sorted that out and we are the mm -hmm. first union mm -hmm. recognized mm -hmm. uh, of sex mm -hmm. workers. And it gave me a great sense of achievement, more than uh, writing a book or an article. Mm. Because it helped. Yeah. I had another experience, a group of a very, very, very strong-willed uh, tribal indigenous people group in, in India called the Land Army in Bombay. Yeah. They came to me and said, look, we, we don't want to uh, seek advice from people who have got foreign degrees, like they had done research on me. But we think you can do something, so we want to ask you a question, and then if you answer the question, we will uh, we will sort of work with you, or let let you work with us. Okay. Uh, so I said, what's the question? And this was the question, Vana. They said, we know this law is oppressive for the poor people. Mm -hmm. It's colonial law. Mm -hmm. It is decadent law. Mm -hmm. We also know we don't have the power to change the legal system. Mm -hmm. Now tell us, how can we use the same law against our oppressors? Mm -hmm. And this was, this is when I be began to become, uh, b began to prepare my people's PhD in law, yeah. as against the JSD yeah. from Berkeley or yeah. whatever. Yeah. 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 I said, I'll take several weeks or months to answer that. Yeah. Uh, because they said we are not revolutionaries, because revolution implies violence and it is unproductive for them and for other people. So how can we use the decadence of Indian legal system as a resource for our rights? Hmm. And you don't have these questions normally raised by a group of jurists. Hmm. Uh, or a bunch of yeah. scholars. Mm -hmm. So it turned me around again and I found many answers into which I won't go, but that was a real education. So three-fourths of my legal learning has come from this kind of stimuli, yeah. questions. And mm -hmm. I've learned this, I've, this I've, uh, I've developed the ability and honesty to say to people, I do not know, but I'll try to learn. Uh, that humility is a kind of bonding. It's not a, a, a posture. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. sharing of uh, ignorance and saying, resolving to remove it for a good cause. But if you have this attitude, excuse me, I didn't want to interrupt you, but not at all. this means also uh, learning in a sense that uh, you do not have just to find something that does exist, but also to invent. And this is the lesson, the greatest lesson I, I took over uh, the time when we uh, had uh, discussions and mm -hmm. meetings and so forth, um, especially with regard to human rights. Um, in the Occidental tradition, it is a question of referring to whether the French Revolution or the American yeah. experience yeah or other traditions going back to antiquity, to the Romans, the Greeks, and so forth, makes for the meaning and the sense of human rights. So this, of course, if this is the starting point, then it is also a closed, uh, a closed affair. You can't go beyond, necessarily. No. But if you're saying uh, we have the right to invent rights, we have the right to think, to imagine human rights. The whole situation changes fundamentally. 
And that is the greatest lesson I took uh, over uh, of the whole time. And I would like to thank you very much for that. But, um, however, there is a remaining question for me. Mm. How could we theorize uh, about the validity grounds of those human rights we might invent? And for those who uh, are perhaps not so familiar with your work, uh, and this would be a mistake, by the way. Uh, uh, I think that your right, you invented the right to laughter as something that is so understandable because it means mm -hmm. uh, you can protest, your authority is not the base of legal value and so forth. But uh, uh, there is a right to irony, to take distance, uh, not to be submissive uh, and oppression is uh, under the rule of irony and the rule of laughter, oppression is much more difficult. So this is very evident, but are you still searching for some general principles of, uh, for the legitimation of human rights? Is there a necessity or would you say um, in order to construct human rights that really may change the world, it is necessary and also sufficient to observe the suffering and then to make the right conclusions. You see, I'm a little bit in between. Yes, I, I as an intellectual, I have this aspiration uh, to generalize, to, ob to objectify, and I have problems also with the conclusion from the is to the ought in a way that might sure, be behind sure, and there is uh, there are major logical problems behind that question so how do you see this uh, this question well that's a very major question <coughs> and uh, briefly I would say uh, there are two ways of thinking about this the people who want to theorize freedom and rights corresponding with human agency and freedom. And a small group of people in academia who want to theorize oppression. Mm. Mm. So it depends on where one starts. Mm. Um, and uh, of course one has to give meanings to these terms and uh, understand mm. their histories mm. and so on. But essentially, is thinking done? for oneself and one's discipline? Or is thinking a fiduciary act mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on behalf, and not at the behest, but on behalf of others? If it's a fiduciary act, since we've got certain cognitive faculties, certain privilege of education or reading, which most people do not have in the world, including mm. in the Western yeah, world, yeah. Uh, European world, so do we, is, is solitary reflection or belonging to traditions of uh, discipline, of thought and inquiry, is that all to thinking and scholarship or there should be something more? Mm. And if there's something more is fiduciary, helping the other, thinking of the other, who didn't have that, then what is it, how does one resolve tension between an uh, knowledge as uh, uh, intellectual property and knowledge as social trust, as it were, or ways oh, yeah. of knowing. Mm -hmm. And this is, these are the kinds of questions that I have wrestled with from my practical experience, yeah. with mm -hmm. women's rights being violated, with indigenous people's rights. Yeah. Uh, they are not interested in arguments about universality or relativity of human rights. No. They are not interested in uh, who created them, although I'm interested. I'll come back yes. to that in a minute. They are interested in how they could even marginally ameliorate the situation, mm. whether it is rights or justice. So it's an mm. existential approach mm. to this whole body of ideas and doctrines and, uh, and thought, histories of thought. But they're also interested in articulating their conceptions eventually mm -hmm. of freedom, responsibility and right, not initially when mm -hmm. they were. Mm -hmm. So there is a great uh, potential there of learning of their visions of yeah. rights and justice. Yeah. So 
So if you come from this from this side of theorizing oppression and not from the side of theorizing freedom. Mm. And I'm not saying these are uh, dichotomous starting points. I think some way those who theorize freedom have to consider how legal subjectivity is created and all that, well, limits to them. They're not dichotomous, but the starting points do mm. matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, mm. um, I give one meaning and one core meaning, and that's suffering. Yeah. yeah other ex expressions, exploitation, immiseration, impoverishment, I take yeah. the idea of suffering. Yeah. And, and the intensity of suffering is, is an aspect of oppressive systems, of oppressive mm. uh, knowledges. Now, how do you move from the fact of suffering to mm. your question, to mm. the value mm. or the ideals of human rights? Well, uh, there's a great uh, Jewish, I think, what, what is it, Jelenic, mm. who used to say, I think it was him, mm. who always spoke about the normative tendency of the factual. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, yes, absolutely. So yes, in a that, sense, that is so, certainly uh, so, uh, one possible answer to that. Certainly, yeah. certainly yeah. From, the, yeah. from the facts of existence uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the, from the facts of suffering and from the fact of struggle yeah. and from the uh, fact of trying to change patterns of operation yeah. uh, arises a certain value system. Now, if you are a human, of course, there will be a problem, but yeah. even Hume wasn't that uh, monocausal about yeah values and facts on one reading of him. But leaving that aside, I think it is now recognized even by callous agencies like the United Nations mm. that extreme poverty, which is a fact, ought not to be tolerated with a value. So that everything should be organized. Now, why should one say, one can stop by saying that the world, in the world there exists completely avoidable poverty. It is, it is. That's the one's descriptive. Uh, no obligation immediately follows from it. Yeah, yeah. But then one puts the struggle, the resistance, the uh, demos prudence, the jurisprudence of the demos, as again, jurisprudence mm -hmm. of law and state, mm -hmm. other voices together, one is able to say that the experience of radical evil, of impoverishment, is a ground for validity for doing something about it. It may be very poor epistemology. But <laughs> no, no, but I do understand, uh, I think very well. Uh, I have, uh, when we take really suffering as the basis of validity, I have something in, in my mind uh, where you might perhaps be very sceptical about uh, that suffering in my understanding um, is part of, of uh, a religious semantic. To identify, to describe um, the life or the non-life of people as suffering mm -hmm. might be seen just in the light of certain religiously impregnated values in the suffering that for Buddhism, but for other, for Christianism, for the great religions, the world religions, as right. one said, uh, the suffering is a major point. Yes. And and how to how to deal with the suffering? How to uh, to go beyond the suffering? That's the message of of religion. And so, uh, excuse me to say that uh, I don't know whether it's a civil religion uh, behind, uh, in the sense of Robert and Bella, or if there is, as you come from this as uh, Occidentals say, the laboratory of religious ideas from India, is there something religiously impregnated behind your emphasis on the suffering? Well, many of the poetry I read, including Gujarati uh, language, which is my mother tongue, um, did have this, uh, this um, 
uh, understanding of suffering or existential suffering in religious terms. Yeah. Uh, one of the great poets of India uh, called Narsim Mehta wrote in Gujarati mm -hmm. and his uh, song was used by Mahatma Gandhi as a mm -hmm. rallying point. And it says this, one of the stanza says, Vaishnava janato tenere kaye, jo peed parai janere. A good is. person, the Vaishnava jan, mm -hmm. is that being who knows the sufferings of others well. Oh, yes, I see. Mm. That's a good person. Oh, that's idea. a good, yeah. I think oh, 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 yes. So, oh, yes. There are religious ideas yeah. there about suffering which form a part of one's unconscious. Whether one is an atheist, agnostic, it doesn't. Mm. Yeah, like a Jungian so. unconscious kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. But the divide comes by saying we understand the religious emphasis on suffering, but we don't accept the cosmology that mm -hmm. lies. So if okay. you as a, a Hindu believe, uh, afterlife, many births, I think mm -hmm. 72 million births and so on. Okay. And you might be born as a human being all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, because if you've not done good work in one's life, then you go back. And I yes. always ask, sec my secular prayer, I ask whoever is out there, up in yes. the sky, well, look, if you think I've done badly in this life, or messed around people's lives, or, or law, or anything, and you don't want to give me human birth, either give me the birth as a rhinoceros or a cockroach. Mm -hmm. And they're sturdy animals. But that jokes apart. There's no yeah. cosmology which naturalized suffering. Yeah. Uh, it is. It is therefore not exactly. a problem. Yeah. That it doesn't problematize. Yeah. Most religions, mm. as a, a suffering is a path to salvation. Suffering exactly. is a surrender to God's will. Suffering is a punishment for past whatever, a misdeeds, a bad karma, karmas, um, uh, and or, or it naturalizes poverty. Yeah. Uh, yeah Lord yeah. Jesus used yeah, to yeah. say, you know, poor shall always be with us. So. It's a kind of, whether you take theological voluntarist or theological rational, theological rationalists are a different, have a different approach. But cosmologically grounded ideas of hmm. emancipation from suffering are not okay for me. I do not you, know the... You're breaking through the circle, exactly. That's what you're doing. Not, that's, that's not. But, but, but you're but referring to, excuse me, uh, but you're referring to the same idea. It is not salvation, it is not justification, it is not legitimation yes. of the evil. It is the contrary. It is the means to fight against the evil. And so you're turning uh, a certain meaning that suffering had in the history of religious ideas yes. into the contrary. And I think that's a wonderful figure of thought. Yes, it's certainly, uh, and, and because um, um, uh, uh, people whom I've met are, uh, who are uh, whose problems I've tried to help with, uh, including even the, the untouchables, yeah. are encased in that cosmology and fatalism yeah. that brings yeah. it. They, yeah. uh, um, you know, and that, that uh, it, one has to respect their deepest convictions yes. when you interact with them. Yeah, of, of, one has of, to of leave course. aside one's own uh, fabulous ideas. Yeah. But when you sit back and look at this uh, at the level of theory of history, um, uh, other worldly religions, as, uh, as they were called by Max mm -hmm. Weber and others, um, or um, kinds of theodicy. Yeah. Mm, that uh, God can create evil, although he or he is omnipotent, omniscient, and whatever. Uh, these are interesting issues in theology, and there are many versions of that. We know that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question does arise then, is are, you, are, are the idea of human rights, uh, relating human rights to suffering, is it a secularizing mode of relating, of thinking mm. about mm. human rights? And I say no. Yeah. It doesn't have argument. to be secularizing. Yeah. Mm. It has to be respectful of uh, faiths. Yeah. Yeah. 
but not imprisoned by them. Okay. That's, that's, An important, that's the that tension. Yes, yeah, that's the tension. Yeah, the tension. And um, uh, so thank you very much for this elucidation about a very important point uh, in our discussions for what we, we had for a while. Um, when you think to um, when you think um, from where you started your um, analysis from India uh, to the United States, uh, an experience on a campus, uh, then going to Sydney uh, to be with uh, indigenous people and they are also to invent their rights, not only to land, but uh, perhaps also the cultural rights. We didn't talk about that. That's also an important point, I would say, where a lot of discussion would be needed to do that. Uh, there one has, gets the impression that uh, going out of the Occidental world, but, being, but remaining in touch with a certain Kelsen, perhaps sometimes in a critical way with a certain Weber, Particular gap art? Or, or, <laughs> or, or, or a special a, gap art. Or a Durkheim Dada, Durkheim Dada. as you say, <laughs> we are in the Durkheim Salon here. So there seems to be a, really a, a very rich exchange. However, some uh, of the post colonialists and post developmentalists uh, are taking uh, 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 um, a radical attitude nothing against radical uh, 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 attitudes, but in this case uh, where the Occidental thought is really um, thought to have come to its end and there is no reason to. So I would be a little bit interested in that. You, of course, you are going beyond and the question of how to go beyond is an important one for you. What would you say today? Uh, what could we learn from post-colonial thinking in Germany, in, uh, in Europe, uh, with regard to uh, legal questions, fundamental questions we have at the moment in this country. And perhaps is there also something that post-colonial, post-developmentalist thought could learn from those old uh, European uh, theorists? No, I, I certainly think, and I, this is my firm conviction that uh, we should take knowledge from all directions. There's a great verse, is, uh, we call it Sloka from Rugu Veda. Mm -hmm. Let knowledge come to me from all directions. Uh, I would agree. You know, <laughs> yes, so it of is course. not. But I'm then, very grateful. Uh, but, uh, but then, uh, what kind of knowledge? Whose knowledge? Um, yeah. You know, there's a, uh, a contemporary. Uh, uh, neurobiology and neuroscience and neurophilosophy. Okay. Uh, the question, and Lacan formulated very well, he said, human mind is, is not individual, it's a group of persons. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. many persons inside yeah, us course. when we think. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to find out which one is thinking and why yeah. I'm letting him think inside my mind. Oh, wow. Con it's collective very, consciousness. In, yeah, in so the it is a, is a mind is a very, very crowded place. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Indeed. <laughs> Heavy duty traffic. Yeah. No, so I think, I think, uh, but I, I also think that the, uh, concerning the question, um, what can uh, the European others learn from uh, the post-colonial discourse? And the first and obvious in relation to law is to understand the relationship between law and violence. Yeah. Colonization mm -hmm. for 250 years, recent colonization, and many earlier ones, was a system of pure and unmitigated violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and even when you read Derrida and Benjamin on divine violence yes. or foundational okay. violence, yes. how yeah. does it relate yeah. uh, to no matter civilizing mission of Europe or white man's burden or whatever, how did it happen that the most illuminating minds of the time of enlightenment mm -hmm. and subsequent thinkers mm -hmm. um, even justified this violence? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And and then what that what how do we understand this? And if we if we say rule of law and uh, it's a good thing and separation of powers and independent independence of judiciary, all this um, uh, commodities in the big shopping mall that now our global market for legal ideas. Yes, yeah. That's fine. They are important mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. But why was this amnesia? Mm -hmm. So what what we well, where the meeting ground really when I shortly put is between the post-colonial critique and the people who criticize the dark side of enlightenment and uh, and what I whom I call progressive A to Z Agamben to Zizek thinkers. Okay. You know what I'm and that's where the uh, meeting ground comes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, I think. Um, Post-colonial uh, uh, studies at least encourage the European others to take the non-European other thinkers seriously yeah. and give them dignity of discourse. Yeah. Like a that's, medical that's yes, of Yes. It course. doesn't happen. This institute is a great refreshing change because of your personal outlook and uh, commitment no, thank you to broaden the frame, but it doesn't normally happen. Mm. So that you know, if we ask in any good place of learning in Europe, name me five Chinese philosophers, or five Indian philosophers, or five African philosophers, yeah. you you will normally not reach that five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or true. you will get that five with all the expatriate names, not yeah. the local names. <laughs> okay. So I think there is a problem. Yeah. Uh, 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 this uh, asymmetry. Mm. Mm. And the notion that uh, everything is mimesis, mm. uh, that uh, you know everything that uh, the, the, the point of origin is always in Europe, mm. the point of reproduction is always elsewhere, yeah. has to be shaken. And I think this mixing of the critics mm. of uh, enlightenment, uh, dark side of enlightenment, yeah. And the post colonial should be coming together more than is the case, yeah, and that would and um, and finally, of course, you cannot anymore think only of scholarship, uh, and I think the yeah. activists, social activists oh, yeah. on all sides, and they have stolen a march over academics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at the World Social Forum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look at people supporting Tunis or the Arab Spring and even Egypt yes, and so on. Exactly, exactly. So people theorizing those movements. So they, 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 uh, in a sense, these are not uh, uh, experts, but they are, they are changing the world yeah. in a sense. So understanding that relationship is also very important. It can't be reproduction of French Revolution or American Revolution. It's something more and something less than that. Something different. So. There are meeting points between this yeah, post-colonial and the, and the post-modern or, yeah. or, the, or the classical and the critical uh, studies. And it's amazing, to forgive me to say, why read Weber and Durkheim, for example, and Karl Marx? Yeah. Uh, is because they speak to modern condition yeah. of suffering and rightlessness. And that's the point about classic, as Robert, Robert Merton said, the classic yeah. is something that has a meaning for every generation. So in this sense, uh, I, 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 I'm very sure that you have become um, yet a classic in human rights studies. Excuse me to say that, no, but no, I, it, I, is, it is simply true. Uh, the last question I have for reasons of time, I would like to continue for no. hours, uh, is a difficult one and perhaps something you can't answer. And this would be no problem. I'm just looking again at the long list of your contributions. Transformative constitutionalism, Dr. Ambedkar, you were talking about oh, yes. yeah. uh, when we, uh, for the statute. Taking human rights seriously, aesthetics of the human rights. Then the Arab Spring with the questions of dignity yes. and human rights involved. Uh, the human rights debate in a globalized world Sovereign that human rights, global impoverishment, human rights as normative structures of human civilization, the discussion we had with Searle. Right. Has there been, to take only those points uh, and visible points, and in between there had been a lot of discussions too, 
has there been something where you would say, if you look back to this period, uh, I brought perhaps a lot to them, but was there something where you said, so there I had to change my mind, I had to change my perspective, I had to go further, I had to be more radical, less radical, something of that kind, uh, an anecdote you could tell us? Well, not an anecdote. I can tell you one thing that I, in my discussions with you and uh, discussions with other colleagues, but certainly with you, is this question you've always been raising of religious cultures. Where, yeah. where does it come from? And um, your emphasis on uh, pluralization of suffering, in a sense, in, in, a, in a very big way. Um, pluralization without naturalization. Yeah. Exactly. That would be my case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, 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 relativity of suffering is, of course, uh, true. So, so, one of the things I have uh, learned to, uh, I'm now is determined to think a little bit more about mm. from this association with the U and the Institute is the elaboration of, critical elaboration of notion of suffering itself. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, told by my critical left group friends mm -hmm. that I'm a negative utilitarian. Okay. Because okay. Bentham was all about a yeah. maximizing yes. pleasure, I'm saying yeah. minimizing pain, yeah. which is yeah. the Bentham yeah. framework. Yeah. And that compliment I did not take seriously. Mm -hmm. Because it was not meant seriously. Yeah. But your mm -hmm. critique, I think, it points to um, a production of different modes of understanding of mm -hmm. suffering. Mm -hmm starting with the cosmological and religious, yes. the civic religion and so on. Uh, and uh, that and I think the uh, most interesting part has been for me here is um, this whole question of anachronism. That is how to bring from the contemporary vantage yeah. point, yeah. how to bring to the classical texts yeah which I express a decolonizing way, but we only okay. use this term. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you re, how do you make these texts not just as having potential to speak to different mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. but having actual meaning the and meaning. contribution yeah. to yeah. make. Yeah. And I think your work on Weber and other colleagues' work on Weber, it means that you need to have a lifetime Mm. A dedication of a lifetime to study the texts mm. that one cannot, as my one of my professors used to tell me, uh, he used to say, Bakshi, you can't read as you run. <laughs> <laughs> That's, <laughs> it's, it's true, and I tell it to my students <laughs> now, of course. It's a, yeah. it's a very, very profound remark. But, um, when, 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 you, when you bring this question, uh, at the end of the day, one says, all right, I read Weber more carefully or do crime than any other human being has. Mm -hmm. And the question is wonderful. How do you relate it? Absolutely. To theorizing repression. I've uh, got only uh, a closed mind, kind of, I, I only want a litmus question. How do you relate it to oppression? Yeah. Okay. And uh, that then that doesn't devalue the dedication of time no, and no. enormous talent one brings to it. Um, and I think Derrida was a master in that. He, the way he read texts, including Hamlet. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, his problem was not something called theorizing oppression, but he came yeah. back yeah. to yeah, yeah. various uh, understandings. Mm -hmm of the contemporary situation. Yeah, yeah. certainly. He respecting the integrity of text, integrity of structures of interpretation, yeah, yeah, the yeah. history, I mean, there was a classical textualist, yeah, yes, no doubt. Of course. Um, but then the same question comes to Derrida from me. How far do you help me theorize oppression? Yeah. A single-mindedness is terrible, you know, one feels sometimes so uh, tunneled and boxed into one perspective. But it is, it comes out of my obligation to use my power of reading, writing and thinking to contribute a smallest bit 
to the problem of suffering and rightlessness. It's an ethical conviction. It might be completely misplaced, but there it is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, dear friend. It was a pleasure. It was wonderful. Thank you.